Great. We're in a series looking at a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of Christians in the town of Colossae. It was just a little town now which would be in uh, eastern, uh, Western Europe, uh, Western Turkey. Uh, it was a church, a town that he had never been to. It was a church that he hadn't planted. He hadn't had anything to do with them apart from, from perhaps having an influence in, in the lives of two or three men who he had met in Ephesus and who had come to faith in Jesus in Ephesus and then gone back home to Colossae with this message burning in their hearts and had planted this little church there in this, in this town. Uh, last time, we looked at, Col at Colossians chapter 1. And what is perhaps one of the, the keynote passages of this letter? Because if we get this part right in the letter, we get a whole heap of stuff right. And if we get this part right in our lives, that is an understanding of who Jesus really is, it will change our lives forever. It will transform us. It will give us the right perspective on who Jesus is and how we should live. We learnt that Jesus is, was the creator. He was the head of the church. He was the reconciler of men through his death on the cross. He was the one who brought community into, into this fellowship. He was the one of whom it was said, God was pleased to have all his fullness to dwell in him. That he was God in flesh. And when people want to know what does God look like, we could say, look at Jesus. Because as we look at Jesus, then we will start to understand who God is. And we look at what Jesus did and we can see what God does. And we can understand something of him. And before we get into today's, today's message, I want us to read that, that scripture again from chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, because it just gives us that, that foundation. So Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, talking about Jesus. He is the, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and were created for him. He is the before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We've been brought into this amazing relationship with the living God, with the God who is the creator of everything. As we pointed out in an earlier message, that there is more evidence, according to Josh McDowell in his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, there is more evidence that Jesus Christ lived, died, was buried, and rose again than there is that Julius Caesar ever lived. And nobody ever doubts the fact that Julius Caesar lived. And so if there's more evidence for the, for the reality of, of Christ than Caesar then let's grab hold of that with a firm assurance. We don't have to doubt his existence. We don't have to doubt his death. We don't have to doubt his burial. We don't have to doubt his resurrection. We don't have to doubt his ascension back into heaven. We don't have to doubt that he sent his Holy Spirit to replace him and to do through us what he wanted to, would have done and did while he was here. And this is the good news that changes everything for us. And so when we, when we think about it, this is a, a, a quote that I have on my wall in my office, that the vision we have of Christ will determine our vision of the church. So if I have a low view of Christ, I'll have a low view of church. If Christ means nothing to me, church will mean nothing to me. This isn't on my wall, but it also a cor correlates to that. And I think the, the vice versa part of it is that the vision I have of the church will reflect 
our vision will reflect my vision of Christ. And it may be that I, I think church is a bit ho-hum. Doesn't mean much to me. It may reflect that that is my attitude towards Christ. Of course, if, if you're here today as a believer in Jesus Christ, one would expect that that is what you are thinking. You have a high view of Christ, you have a high view of all that he is, and you'll have a high view of his church. So let's read the passage for today in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. With Paul having made this, made this statement, he, he went on to talk about the fact that there was a time when we were alienated, we were foreigners to Christ. We weren't in part of the family. We hadn't come into the good of, of, uh, of salvation. The, the fact that he had died for us and, and lives for us hadn't become a reality. And in verse 24, he goes on from that to say, And now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I became its servant by the commission that God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden in ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, that's the non-Jewish community, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Paul is giving us here a, an insight into the heart and to, into the mind of a servant, of which he considered himself to be. And when you look at verse 24, if you've still got your Bible open, if you're still looking at that text, what, what strikes you as weird in verse 24? Or strange, or different, or unexpected? He rejoiced in his suffering. How weird is that? When you see somebody bring out the whip and he's going to lash it across your back, you think, oh, that's cool. I look forward to that. Or they take you out of the, out of the town and into the into Market Square and you see a great pile of rocks there, as happened to Paul on, on three occasions. And they tie him up and they lay him down. And he knows that that pile of rocks is going to be hurled at him to smash his head and to smash his body and to kill him. And you go, ooh, this is a nice pile of rocks. They're going to rock me to sleep. What a wonderful experience. No. Or when you see the stocks, and if they're going to put your hands and your feet in the stocks, and some of them put your head in the stocks as well, and left you there in the most uncomfortable position possible. And when Paul looked at the sufferings and he thought about his sufferings, he thought, I can rejoice in that. That's not natural, not common. But James thought the same thing in James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 of his letter. He was the brother of Jesus. He said, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. <laughs> yeah, right, James. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Well, there's a little key in there for us. And Paul did. He says, well, why did he rejoice? Well, first of all, he said he rejoiced because it was good for the church that he should suffer. If he hadn't suffered for the gospel's sake, if he hadn't suffered for, for taking the message from, from that, he, that he had been given to, to the nations, it would never have got to Asia. And it would never have got to New Zealand through Samuel Marsden. There would have been no message that would have got this far. It was because he suffered and because of the rejection of that message that, that he suffered. And just to get an idea of how much he suffered, again, if you've got your Bible with it, have, have a look at, at the, what he wrote to the, the Christians in, in, um, in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians, 
and in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he said this, What anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? <laughs> I'm out of my mind to talk like this, but I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. The Jews always only gave you 39 lashes. 40 was what they could give, but they pulled one back for fear of going over and breaking the law. They were pretty kind like that. So you just get 39 whips across the back. Well, 39 times 5 is what? 195? Yep. That's how many lashes across his back he had had from his fellow Jews because of the gospel. Can you imagine what his back must have looked like? When he took his, took his shirt off and went for a swim and you saw his back and that was just from one of the types of torture that he went, 49 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods and I've got no idea what that meant. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. I said three times he was, he was stoned. I got that wrong with his shipwreck. Sorry about that. I spent a night and a day in the open sea and I had been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. You sort of get the feeling that he'd been in danger, don't you? Just... It was part of what he, he did. He said, I have labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked and beside everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for the churches. Who is weak? And I don't feel weak. Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn for them? He knew what it was to suffer for the church and he said it's good for the church that that happens it's a strange paradox isn't it that somehow in the life of a of a christian man or woman suffering has this the sense of of bringing something out in their soul which is difficult to explain churches around the world the christian message around the world has grown exponentially when the church has been under severe persecution. When communism was reigning in Russia and the church was being persecuted, the church went from obscurity, just all the functioning, to a hothouse for God. In China today, it's really difficult to get. There are numbers which are put out there, but probably still difficult to get a really accurate number of the Christians that now operate in China, but it goes into the millions as a result of persecution. It's sort of like when, when, when Satan says, I want to wipe out the church, that the Spirit of God does something in the life of the believer. They say, we'll put up with anything because Jesus is so precious. That's why that, that first part of, of the chapter where Paul gives us this beautiful picture of Jesus. That's why that has to be so relevant and so poignant to us, that we understand that. Because if you understand and if we understand Jesus like that, then when the persecution comes and when people stand against us, we start to say, no, I will stand for this Jesus. He's worthy of it. Now I'd venture to say that everyone here today has experienced or is experiencing some extreme suffering of one kind or another. There was a time when Lois and I were going through a pretty difficult time. We were feeling crushed. And it was the, the love of friends that came alongside us and showed us something again of the love of Jesus. And at that particular time, some friends came and they just gave us this simple little cross. 
If you ever come into our lounge, you'll find this cross sitting on our, on our bookcase. It's precious to us. Because it reminds us of two things. It reminds us of friends who came close to us when we, when we were down and almost crushed. But it reminds us also of a saviour who loved us so much to send us friends who cared that much. But the text on here is so precious because it reminds us of that saviour. It comes from 2 Samuel 22, verses 2 and 3. And it says, The Lord is my rock. Oh, we needed that. He is my fortress and my saviour. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. When you feel exposed, when you feel like there's no, nothing to shield you from, from attack of any sort, to know that God is your shield, standing there, taking the darts, taking the rocks. The strength of my salvation and my stronghold, my high tower, my saviour. I tell you, when, when things get rough, this cross, this message, becomes a reminder to us that it's not about us. It's about him. And our suffering, and, and it's nothing, nothing like what Paul had. And when I think about it, it, it sort of almost seems pathetic that the stuff that would, would get me down gets me down. I haven't been whipped, I haven't been stoned, I haven't been left to die, I haven't been left hungry, I haven't been left cold and naked and all of that sort of stuff. But that was Paul's experience. When we stay in fellowship with Jesus, then we're able to let that suffering shape and mould and change us. The second reason was that he said that it was filling up what was lacking in Christ's suffering. Now this is a difficult text. There have probably been more debates by theologians and scholars over this one text of the Bible than almost any other verse in the Bible. As I try to wrestle with what, what does it mean? Well, one thing that we do know that it doesn't mean, Paul is not saying here, that the sufferings of Christ on the cross for our sin and for our redemption and for, for making it possible for us to have a relationship with him, Paul is not saying that that was insufficient for our salvation. I need to suffer more to add to that to make salvation effective. He's not saying that. If he did, he would be contradicting, contradicting everything else he had said about faith in Christ and in the sufferings of Christ and in the atonement that we find in him. So he's not saying that. And one thing that everybody does seem to agree on as they think about it is that when there is the suffering that happens and you are involved in the suffering, as Paul had been involved in suffering for Christ's sake, there is a bond that comes between the one who is suffering and the one they are suffering for. It's sort of like, you, you bear that for me? How, how, can that, how can that be? It's a bit like the bond between a mother and her baby. There is a bond there between a mum and a child that us guys will never understand because we haven't gone through the suffering of the birth and anything else has happened in the nine months prior to that. But when the baby is born and the mum takes that baby into her arms all gooey and clingy or whatever, she doesn't give a rip. She just thinks, this is the most beautiful, lovely child. Could be the ugliest looking thing on the face of the earth, but she says, this is the most lovely, beautiful baby that was ever born because she suffered for this one. And there is a bond there that comes as a result of that. The story is told of Dr. Helen Rosevear. But Helen Rosevear had been a doctor in what was the Belgium Congo in those days, in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s. 
called Zaire, now called the Democratic Republic of Congo. And for 12 and a half years, she'd had this frenetic practice in this hospital, ministering and serving and healing the population of about half a million people. Now that same area has about a million and a half people in it. And she'd given herself to that, and she'd given herself to these people. And then in 1964, the revolution came. Belgian Congo became Zaire, became an independent state, and that happened across Africa. But the colonizers hadn't trained the nationals in how to lead. It's thought that there was only one university, African university graduate in the Belgian Congo at the time of independence. And so you get these, these men who, and mainly men, who uh, have no real understanding of politics and of nationhood taking over the nation. And, and if you understand anything about the, the Belgian Congo or Democratic Republic of Congo, you know that even today it is a war-torn nation because of the conflict between so many tribes, and they are big tribes, and it is a big country. But Helen Roosevelt was caught up in the middle of that, and for some time they were, they were able to resist it, and, and, the, and the rebellion never touched them, but it, it overflowed, and eventually she was, she was taken captive and brutally tortured and brutally raped by her captors and was treated so harshly. There came a point that she was just about to be executed and a 17-year-old student came to her defence and he was savagely beaten as a result and he was kicked about like a football and left dead. Dr. Rosevere was sick and for a moment the story goes on to say she... She thought that God had forsaken her even though she did not doubt his reality. But God stepped in, overwhelmed her with a sense of his own presence and said something like this, 20 years ago you asked me for the privilege of being a missionary, the privilege of being identified with me. These are not your sufferings, these are my sufferings. As the force of that at home, the doctor said she was overcome with a great sense of privilege. Helen Roosevelt's sense of identification with Christ, of union with him, was elevated by her suffering, and she rejoiced. She rejoiced. Because there was now a bond with her saviour that she had not previously experienced. Paul said to the Philippians in chapter 3 and verse 10, he said, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. And I love that part. I love that part. I want to know Christ and the mighty power that was his that raised him from the dead. Wow, that would be so wonderful to know that and experience. But he goes on to say, and it's the next part that I'm not so fond of. He says, I want to suffer with him, sharing with him in his death. You see, the reality is you can only experience the joy and the power and the glory of resurrection when you have gone through the pain and the suffering and the trials of death. If Jesus had never died, there would have been no resurrection. And sometimes in my life, I know I have to get to the point of dying to myself and dying to my ambitions and dying to anything that stands between me and God in order that there might be a sense of resurrection power that has the opportunity to flow through. And it may be that within our church there are people and there may be that there are ministries that need to die and, and, and become dead to Christ so that he can resurrect them with a new power and a new direction and a new vision. See, the only time we will really understand something of the power of the resurrection, the only time that we might understand what it means to really know Christ in that power is to be able to, as an individual, as a ministry, as a church fellowship, to know what it means to actually die to him. Paul tells us about the servant's responsibility which God had given to him. It was a God, he was a God-commissioned servant. He knew that. 
verses 25 to 27, he knew that God had appointed him to this great task. And that's true for each of us who are engaged with him in any way. Whatever your service for him, it's not something you've just picked up as something to do. It's something which God has said, I want you to do that. And by the power of my spirit, I will enable you, I'll empower you, I will equip you to do the task that you've got. And I'll, I'll expect you to do it with all glory and all humility. That he gets the glory from that. He's commissioned us. And this gives our role tremendous significance, no matter what that role is. From what might appear to be the least function within the body of Christ to something which may be elevated and looked upon as being a greater service, as far as God is concerned, it's all one. And he's commissioned us all to do that as parts of the body. And Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 that we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago then it's ours to steward he just doesn't want us to take it and be ho-hum about this to be a steward is to care for to manage well this trust that he has given to us this commissioning this role this responsibility and his for Paul it was a responsibility of preaching and taking the good news to those who still don't know it and we must be careful that we don't treat this this responsibility this task ultimately of sharing the wonderful good news of salvation in Jesus, that we don't treat that as a hobby, something we pick up and discard at will. And that might be the, the, the best, the worst we could do is treat it with contempt and say, well, it doesn't really matter, I don't care, it's not my responsibility. Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, so my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable, always be Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. And later on, at the end of this, this letter to Colossians, he, he puts a little footnote to, to one of the guys that's working in the church at Colossae. Whether he was the pastor in the church or a leader in the church, we, we don't particularly know, but he says this, tell Archippus, that was his name, he gives us his name, but he said, tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. You see, the underlying responsibility that we have is that we present this message in all of its fullness. And if you look at verses 26 and 27, if you've still got your Bibles open there, there's another question here. There's, there's something strange again in, in this and how Paul describes the message. How does he describe the message? A mystery, I heard somebody come through. Yeah, a mystery. That's a strange, strange term for something which is so great. But it had been a mystery because he said this is a message that has been not given. It's been held up. It has been almost hidden for generations, but is now being revealed. And in the Old Testament of the Bible, we find in the Jewish community, this message of salvation through Christ was never a reality. But now coming into the New Testament, since the birth, death, resurrection, ascension of Christ, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church, this has become the revelation of this mystery. This is now open. It's sort of like this is an open secret. It's no longer a mystery, no longer a secret. It has now crossed the borders of racism. And the Jews thought that this was a message that was only for them and that the Gentiles shouldn't have any part of it. But it was to go beyond that. For the Jews, it was impossible that anybody could come into a relationship with God who didn't actually come through their rules. Bishop John Green of Sydney tells of, about working with, with a, group of, uh, a group of boys and, and uh, taking them out on outings and, and all the rest of it. And, and there was some who were, were Aboriginal boys and some who were white boys and and there wasn't always a, a good relationship between, between the two races. And you had them all on the bus and, and they're all driving uh, to some place. And, and it almost got too much for him. So he pulled up the bus, got all the boys out of the bus, got them all lined up. White boy, Aboriginal, white boy, Aboriginal, white boy, Aboriginal, white boy, Aboriginal, right down the line. He said, I want you to get on the bus. And as you get on the bus, I want you to say, I'm green. 
I'm green, I'm green, I'm green. So they all get on the bus saying, I'm green. So not white, not black, I'm green. So they, they climb onto the bus and everything's sort of, sort of okay and they, they drive off and he thinks it's, it's all sweet until he hears some wit at the back say, okay, light green on one side, dark green on the other. It seems like there are things like that that can't, we can't get out of our system. And that's what Paul was, was, had, had been struggling with. That's when he said Christ came, and when he came, this, this barrier between the two was broken, and now these two races become one. And it became a whole new uh, relationship that they had. That's the reality for everyone who's accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And this morning, we're, the, we're living proof of that reality and its impact. The message has brought together people of different cultural backgrounds. People who might not normally meet together or associate together because they don't have the same background, they don't have the same interests outside. But the one thing that has brought us all together, the one person who has brought us all here together today, is Jesus. He's, he's our central point. Nothing else matters for us today. He is the focal point. One thing that brings us together is him. So we have this responsibility. We have this person. And I'm going to call, call it in there because I'm only about halfway through where I wanted to go. So we'll pick up the rest of it next time. So, we, so if you are in a difficult situation, if you're finding you are stressed, if you're finding that as... It is, life has become tough. You're almost exhausted. Why don't you take time this morning to meet with the prayer team at the back, at the end of our service. If the, prayer, if the band can come up, we'll, we'll be ready to, to start, finish off. If they meet with the prayer team, just say to them, listen, I, I'm drained. I'm tired. Will you pray for me? that the energy which comes from Christ, from the resurrection power that is his, that that might just so fulfill fill my life, change my life, make my life purposeful again. Father, we want to thank you that all that you have done for, for we want to thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the salvation that he made possible. Thank you for the life that he lived and for the demonstration of your power that operated through his life. We thank you that what we have experienced in him, we, we have the privilege of sharing with others around us. And so we pray that you might be able to take, take it, give us the burden for that responsibility. Give us a love for those who still need to know about you that we might be able to see many more coming into the family, enjoying the blessings and the joy of knowing Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you make Jesus so real and relevant to us, that you empower us, that you equip us, that you open up doors for us of service and of opportunity. I pray that as we move out into this coming week, that we might go with a sense of your presence, Touch us, empower us, guide us, we pray. That we may be able to glorify you. And if we are suffering, if people are really under the cosh today, if you're really feeling crushed today, may they find in you some purpose and be able to, in some almost weird way, be able to rejoice in that. It's something which we will never understand but bond them in their relationship with you, we pray, as we commit ourselves to you now in Jesus' name.